And this is the perfect uh, segue into, I think, what we needed to get into next, which is the evidence that there was, you know, that, that the Lupo family was continuous with the Dequila family and possibly another family that pops up around this time. So this counterfeiting case is akin to the commission case. It takes these very important bosses off the street. There's instability. You know, we know from, you know, over a century of evidence that when bosses are taken off the street, big changes happen. It can be, a, it's a very volatile time. It's a time of political change. New people are taking over. So they are convicted in what happened. What becomes of these organizations that Lupo, let's, let's focus on Lupo. What becomes of the organization that Lupo was running? Well, his brother, John Lupo, at, is the uh, temporary acting boss. And there's another individual whose name we don't have. And um, Sebastiano Di Gattano, acts as the uh, interim boss bosses in place of Morello. And, you know, eventually they realize they're not going to be coming back anytime soon. And so they, they get replaced. Uh, Salvatore D'Aquila was in Sicily and he returned and, and very quickly with Trina. Uh, with Giuseppe Trina. And uh, he quickly becomes the boss of the organization. And I believe it's in 1911 that Manfredi Mineo uh, comes to America and selling becomes a boss in Brooklyn. And we don't know if there's any uh, prior organization there. You know, there's no indication of anything that he took over. He appears to uh, just out of nowhere to become a boss. Lupo did have a presence in Brooklyn, correct? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Um, okay. Basically, we it was called South Brooklyn back then, but now now today you're looking at a map. It's Northwestern Brooklyn. They okay. were. Up in I want to Oak Street. I, I don't know if that's on if it's in Brooklyn Brooklyn Heights. It, it's somewhere around there. Um, that's where the Maneo fam the Maneo crowd was um, listed as being around in the 1910s was on Oak Street. But that is smack dead in you know Palermitan territory that the Gambinos probably had a, had a hold of since the 1870s. Another earlier guy there was a Giuseppe Travato whose daughter ended up marrying Philip Mangano. Um, Giuseppe Travato is an earlier name, and we don't know much about him. And Phil Mangano was the brother of the future Gambino boss, Vincenzo Mangano. Right, it was, was actually his uh, granddaughter. Okay, granddaughter, yes. So that there shows there's, some deg- there's a relationship there between some of these figures who show up later. And you mentioned Giuseppe Traina, you know, who we, were, we learned was likely D'Aquila's conciliary. We know that Traina acted for Salvatore D'Aquila when he became Capo de Capi. He came from the town of Belmonte Mizzano, had close connections to the Philadelphia guys from there. But there was an earlier guy who was likely affiliated with Lupo, Giuseppe Giolombardo, and he was a counterfeiter from Belmonte Mizzano. You say in your article that one of the people who visited him in prison, Giolombardo, was a Salvatore Traina. So maybe a relationship to Giuseppe Traina later. And there's a figure too, I think we could bring up in relation to the earlier decade. Giuseppe Gilombardo was partners with Isidoro Crocevera, who he was associated with Lupo, correct? And then yes, and in the San Giorgi report in Palermo. And then he shows up affiliated with Dequila, right? Is that correct? Crocevera, no. We know that he was in the Gambinos, okay. but there's nothing that ties him directly to Dequila. The guys that we got okay. from, from Lupo to Dequila are um, Joe Fanera, John Fontana, Severio Verzi, the anybody? And uh, Vincenzo Mangano as well. And then the Lochitros, we see the, the Agrigento group, who's an important part of Gambino family history. You know, we see Lupo have these, he has these close relationships to these Tampa connected Agrigentini. The Lochitros are there. Around the time that D'Aquila takes over as boss, 1912, we see the Lochitros are among his closest associates. Filippo Lochitro, you know, hosted right. a meeting of D'Aquila members. And then you mentioned earlier that there was some sort of relationship, a marital relationship between the Lochitros and Lupo. There was a Secret Service report that you showed me, Angelo, where an informant said he heard that the Lochitros were related to Lupo through the women in the Lupo family. We haven't confirmed what that is, what that exact relationship is. I know that John Lupo's wife, I don't know where her family came from. I haven't been able to find the exact records, but her father and mother's surnames, Lacalsi and 
triolo are heavily found in the part of Agrigento where the Lucicero's come from. So because this informant thought that there was a marital relation between the Lupo women and the Lucicero's, I suspect that could be it. Can't state definitively, but we those are those surnames I mentioned, uh, Licalzi and Triolo, are heavily associated with that part of Agrigento. So we see the Lucicero's seem to, sh to show that there was a marital as well, a marital relation as well as association with Lupo. And then that continues under D'Aquila. We know for a fact from Gentile that Vincenzo Lo Cicero was a Capodicina under, under D'Aquila. So that the Agrigento group continued over, it appears, as well. Right. As I mentioned, Vincenzo Lo Cicero's older brother, Filippo, goes way back and, you know, to the even before Lupo is mentioned in the uh, Secret Service files. As far as the report that you mentioned where Lo Cicero is related to the Lupo women, or the other way around. I can find a first name of the Lochitro being referred to. Okay. Philip. Which one was it? Felipe. Philip. Oh, Felipe, okay. Um, because they were talking about the Lochitros on East 39th Street. They would have been talking about Felipe and then likely the brother of its plural, which would have been Vincenzo. Vincenzo was probably always higher up than Philip was, unless people want to make the argument that Vincenzo succeeded Philip. But they um, they both lived pretty long lives. Philip's son, Felix, he was heavily connected to the, the Traficante family. Again, lowercase f, um, marriages, um, you know, godfather and godsons to each other's children. The Traficantes and... Um, They're curries, yeah. The, They're curries were the ones who were the had the baptismal relationship. But then as we were talking about, the Arcuris can be directly connected to the Lochichiros, both geographically as well as through some... We, yeah, we, the Arcuris and the Lochichiros, they can be linked together. That connection was already made, but then you also have the Lochichiros and the Traficante fam, you know, blood families being, you know, connected through, you know, Compaisanismo and marriages and stuff yeah. like that. But then... Going back to our curry, the our curries were always close to um, Tampa as well. And then there's one other, the our curry's son, the guy that got married into the our curries. And I think he's from the same area. What's their, what's their the last Franco's. name? Franco's. Franco's. There you go. Yep. yep. That's another family too that factors in. Yeah. That whole, um, this whole, the whole our curry crew really goes back to that. Just like even the, um, the Joe Butch Corral crew goes back to Domino. He's the first guy we can identify down in, um, he was head of the Sacatani down in, you know, Little Italy. And then later on, it was Joe Parla Piano in the 30s. And then eventually after that, it became the Molise, um, what's his name, um, Lombardosi. I mean, yeah. he came up in a Sacatani crew, became captain of it, you know, and then it eventually reverted back to um, Joe Butch Corral, who... He was a fourth generation American, I want to say, but his family goes all the way back from Siaka. And Gotti once said that he's too Sicilian, which was pretty interesting. Yeah. With some of these connections, too, one thing we know from later sources is that Joe R. Curry was a liaison to both the Tampa and de Cavalcante families because the de Cavalcante family was likely formed and certainly made up of a huge percentage of men from Ribera and neighboring villages in Agrigento. That's very close to the Arcuri's hometown of Alessandria della Rocca. And then, interestingly, the Lochicheros were from Calamanachi. One of, I, I believe, Filippo Lochicheros' son was born in Ribera. Because Calamanachi is barely a, a comune. It's, it's a tiny little place next to Ribera. And so the fact that Arcuri, much later, is the liaison to the Cavalcantes in Tampa. You know, we've already established the Tampa connection there. But it indicates to me that the Lochicheros being basically from Ribera, the, the our curry relationship, the Decavalcantes, could be a, a continuation of some relationship there that we can't substantiate. Either way, these Compaisani groups have a long history together, and we even see that into relative relative modernity. Very true. Right. It, it could reflect earlier trend relationships that existed in Sicily before they even came to America. And then two, uh, Vincenzo Lochicero had two sons who would later be Gambino members. There's uh, Felix, who we talked about, who lived in Tampa. He had another son, Joe, who was identified as a Gambino member. So that's two of, of Vincenzo Lochicero's sons. So this is a family that doesn't get much attention, but clearly they held immense stature in the Lupo d'Aquila era. And then we see that continue under these spiritual successors, if not literal, direct successors of these crews, the Arcuris and their uh, their close friends. And, and so 
I don't think we really covered this when it came up a, a minute ago, but so around 1910, these guys are convicted. I think it was in 1910 that Lupo's convicted. It looks like Giovanni Lupo, John Lupo, his brother, is helping run things. In your article, you identify a Don Sebastiano, whose surname and identity is unknown. He's not Sebastiano di Gaetano, who's the acting capo de capi, but Correct. there's this Don, this Don Sebastiano who along with, with John Lupo is kind of directing things. It doesn't appear that they immediately elected a formal successor to Lupo. Uh, so they're kind of running things in the interim. It's obviously a period of instability. If John Lupo and Don Sebastiano are kind of running things, it indicates Lupo initially may have held onto the seat or they didn't immediately find somebody to, to succeed him. They were Man, fighting an appeal or they were trying to appeal their decision. Again, 20 years for what's a five-year sentence was just unheard of. So they right. thought they had a lot of good grounds for appeal. But then by 1912, it was pretty much established that they're not coming home. So then they had to formally elect new leaders. John Pecorero was actually acting for Joe Morello. Um, okay. Pecorero, he's a name that'll come up again in the 20s. Um, we don't want to go that far forward with this one. Yeah. But um, John Pecorero, he accepted Salvatore Clemente. He's Corleonese. He um, was around in the 1890s, got in trouble, served 10 years, came out and offered to become an informant. But he was quite open with the SS that he had to transfer back to New York from Chicago. And the guy taking his letter was John Pecorero. John Pecorero from Piana de Greci, Albanese now, was a long time, always in the vicinity of um, Joe Morello. Even Camito speaks about him. Yeah, his, yeah uh, we won't go into him here, but Pecorero's son ended up with the Gambino family. His nephew slash son-in-law was Marco Lamandri who was with the New York family and then ended up in LA. So this is a clan of their own, uh, which I think we'll elaborate on when we focus on the Morellos. Uh, but with uh, Clemente, I'm glad you mentioned him because he was a, one of the main sources of a lot of the information we're discussing here. Salvatore Clemente was a Morello member, as you said, transferred to Chicago, transferred back. He was a secret service informant, providing inside information, really, uh, giving rare insight into these early organizations. So we actually have a solid member source who was providing a play-by-play -play on a lot of this information. He He's a guy that really deserves his own episode to be discussed about. He's earliest form of Greg Scarpa that we have. He was a dry informant for 15, 20 years. We can go into him more, but he provided a lot of information that we otherwise would not have had, uh, right. thanks to the few things that we were able to get from him. And so uh, now we're in 1912. You know, they're, they're trying to appeal this sentence. John Lupo and Don, possibly Don Sebastiano, whoever he is, are helping direct the Lupo family. There's an interim capo de capi. And just, just so people understand that, in 1930, when, or 1931, somewhere around there, when Joe Masseria is deposed as capo de capi, they appointed another interim capo, who was uh, Gaspar Messina of Boston. We know that Giuseppe Trina, who we already discussed, uh, he served as an acting capo de capi when D'Aquila couldn't attend national assembly meetings. He did that at least once. So it was possible to have these kind of acting or interim capo de capi as well, just like we see acting bosses, acting underbosses, acting capo de china. It appears they could appoint, a, they probably elected him given the nature of the position, an acting capo de capi. But as you said in your article, Sebastiano de Gaetano, who was probably the Bonanno boss by then, he doesn't seem to want it permanently. He seems to just be kind of making sure that there is somebody in that position. 1912, he steps down. It appears that Lupo was either taken down or willingly stepped down. And the next thing we know, and I think this did come from Clemente, correct me if I'm wrong, but then we find out that Salvatore D'Aquila is now boss of a family that is made up of men from Palermo and Agrigento. And that shows, at least among the membership, there was you know some sort of continuation with the Lupo group. But then Manfredi Mineo, Mineo, he had come over the year previous. And all of a sudden, he's the boss of a new family. We don't know a lot about the makeup of the family, but now there are four families all of a sudden. We don't, maybe, maybe there was another family we just don't know about. It seems unlikely. But all of a sudden, the Lupo network now has two families that branched out. Much as we 
we see 10 years later when the Morello family splits into the Genovese and Lucchese, we now have the Dequila and Mineo. And that would be confusing to people because Mineo is a well-known name. He was murdered during the Castellamurius War. He actually succeeded Lupo, or he succeeded Dequila as boss in 1928 when Dequila was killed. Dequila will get his own episode, so we won't go too in-depth on him. How do you reconcile the fact that Minio emerges as a boss of his own family in 1912 alongside Dequila, and then in 1928 succeeds Dequila? Rick, you want to go? Well, that's, uh, <laughs> no, we don't have all the answers either. You know, we're, we don't, you know, put our theories before the facts. You know, we're, we try to follow the evidence. And sometimes the evidence is very confusing. You know, with uh, Mineo, we see connections to the uh, early Provacci family. You know, we, uh, there's another document from another informant in the early 30s who describes these connections that uh, Mineo still appears to have a certain con- amount of control over these individuals. Although uh, uh, Salvatore uh, Di Bella is apparently the actual boss at that time over before Joe Provacci became boss, Salvatore Di Bella was its leader. And Salvatore Di Bella's son in the 1970s, uh, Tom Di Bella, became the boss. There was an informant who, when Tom Di Bella was elected, this Colombo member who was informing, not Scarpa, but another guy, he said he was told Tom Di Bella's father was an early boss of our family. Right. And this is the time period that he was a boss. We know very little about his uh, organized crime activities. You know, there's just not much to write about. Brooklyn Docks. Yeah, so he was a, uh, Salvatore De Bella was a doc boss, just like his son would be. That's all I know, though. Yeah, we we don't have a crew numbers that actually name him as being connected. And uh, and there's also very few people named as being connected to and Freddie Mineo. So prior to Mineo taking over and replacing D'Aquila in 1928, Shortly after he became boss in, uh, I believe it was in 1912, the other families went to war against the Aquila's family. And we don't really know the reasoning behind that either. You know, we can speculate, we can make some educated guesses uh, based on circumstantial evidence, but we don't have the specifics. You know, it's, it's unfortunate that uh, you have such a great witness in the person of Salvatore Clemente, and he wasn't asked these questions. Right. Because he would have had the answers. You know, and it's evident to me from, from you guys have shown me some of these original sources, the Secret Service files and everything. It's evident to me that Minio was boss of his own family by 1912, by the 1910s. There are numerous references spanning many years, even into the 20s, that Minio appears to be directing his own family as I think, Angelo, or you mentioned a second ago, we have members of the future Profaci family linked to Mineo, taking orders, I believe carrying out murders on his behalf. Then all of a sudden he switches over. But we know that was possible. I think that's an important part of this, that even though it seems kind of strange that Mineo would have been boss of his own family, then Dequila gets killed and Mineo jumps over and becomes boss of another family. There may have been a political justification, a political reason. And the fact that Mineo was from Palermo, from the same neighborhoods that Dequila was from, had a lot of the same relationships, may have been a big factor. Well, since we're going, a, that's going a little bit further into it, into the 1920s and then... Right some things of Maneo and Dequila's background should be noted upon, but jumping that far forward, Masseria kind of had a thing for installing people from one group into other groups, it seemed, it appears to be. How common that was earlier on, we just really don't know. We know that guys did move around and guys did assume positions. Going back to Maneo though, so Again, 1912, these guys get convicted. Everyone's off the street. 1911, um, both Maneo and Aquila come. Aquila comes back to America. Maneo arrives, you know, for the first time. He's there with a friend of his, uh, Vincenzo Bergucci, I want to say. He's also from Palermo. They get arrested. One guy that day, the SS failed to arrest that came over with them was Antonino Grillo. Antonino Grillo is the boss of Resutana during this period. He was also mentioned in the San Giorgi report back in 1898. And... Antonino Grillo remained a very important figure in um, Palermo Mafia affairs up until the 1920s, at least. There was a war in the 1920s. Oh, no, jumping back. Mineo and Grillo are actually in-laws. 
one of one of the other married their sisters. But then yeah, John Gr 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 yeah, Grillo married Manfredi Mineo's sister. There you go. Yep. And then jump into 1920, there was some dispute in Palermo, and that's when D'Aquila ended up sending help and assistance over there, like five thousand dollars we don't know if that's um usd or lira but then he also sent over people to kind of mediate and help out he was seen as a grillo ally but right. then in 1921 22 there's another dispute and then that causes people doing back and forth travels and grillo got involved in that as well so yeah Gr grillo is an important connecting piece in all this as you mentioned he's the brother-in-law of man freddie minio he comes with Minio and the other guy you mentioned in 1911. So he accompanies his brother-in-law. He may already be the boss of Resutana. He's already very important in Palermo. And he was a, he controlled a shipping fleet and he had international connections. I've looked into him a little bit. He lived on a, a luxurious estate right in Palermo. So Grillo was an upper class mafioso. Minio was as well. Minio's brother, we'll go into Minio another time, but Minio's brother was a doctor and professor of note. And uh, his brother, Dr. Corrado Minio's grandson, I believe is a politician today in Sicily. So this is an, an aristocratic family. And so again, we like we see with Lupo and Morello marrying each other, marrying into each other, we see the relationship between Minio and Grillo is very important too. The fact that those two families intermarried married, the gorilla was the boss of Resutana in Palermo, and Minio comes to the U.S., and a year later, he's a boss. That speaks to Minio's stature. And uh, then uh, Grillo was also linked to a guy, Francesco Zito, who I believe was from Toretta, who was also in the mix in Brooklyn. And Toretta's a, a town that, because uh, Grillo had come to the U.S. previously and he arrived to Zito. And so there's a connection to this guy from Toretta, which is a town heavily linked to the Gambino family. Then, as you said, Grillo is an ally, or Dequila is an ally of Grillo in a Palermo war in the 20s. We have sources who state that Dequila sent resources as well as personnel to assist Grillo. We have an idea of who some of those might be. We know that Jimmy D. Leonardo, Michael's grandfather, went to Sicily right as that war was ramping up, and he was accompanied by Paolo Palmieri, Buffalo member. Uh, Michael was aware of Buffalo being a, a close ally of Dequila, so it makes sense that Jimmy D. Leonardo and Paolo Palmieri went together. A year, a year later, Giuseppe Traina and Vincenzo Mangano. So they were likely, these are high-ranking Dequila members. They were likely going to assist not only Grillo, but who was Grillo's chief ally in the Palermo War? Francesco Motizi, Lupo's brother-in-law. So the brothers-in-law of Minio and Lupo are, are both bosses in Palermo in the 20s at war with, I believe his name was Antonino Gentile. Uh, he was a rival Palermo boss. They were fighting over some sort of contracting dispute, jobs, something to that effect. But let's go back to Lupo, where in 1922, or just the early 20s, Lupo and Morello are going to be paroled. I don't know how much, I think we'll go into this more in a Dequila episode, but Lupo and Morello both go to Sicily because Dequila has issued a death sentence. They obviously are going to disrupt the power structure that Dequila has established as the capo de capi and boss. And he issues a death sentence on both men. They both go to Sicily to petition to have the death sentence lifted, which shows the influence that Sicily still had. Lupo comes back in 1922 from his trip to Sicily with Antonino Grillo. It's on the ship manifest. So Antonino Grillo, boss of Resutana, Minio's brother-in-law, comes to the U.S. with Minio in 1911. Lupo goes to Palermo to get his death sentence lifted. He comes back with Grillo. And then a few years later, Dequila is helping Grillo fight his war in Palermo along with Lupo's brother-in-law. I'm not even going to try to begin to dissect these relationships, but Dequila and Minio are rivals, serious rivals. There's wars going on between them in New York that we'll go into another time. Right, and, and something else that's relevant is that one of the people who, who he, Morello undoubtedly met in Palermo was Salvatore Maranzano, who at that time was the uh, uh, provincial capital of the province of Trapani. Right, and he's living in Palermo, yep. And so Maranzano's in the mix now, too, you know. So we got all these big names. And uh, the interesting thing about Grillo accompanying Lupo back in 1922, and on the same ship is the boss of, of the San Ciparillo family, Vito Todero. He had survived a murder attempt in San Ciparillo. Don't need to go into that, but it's just interesting that three bosses or former bosses are on the same ship together coming back from Palermo. It's evident to me that Lupo likely petitioned Grillo. Grillo may have played a role in helping Lupo lift his death sentence. 
And then what's very interesting, you guys go into this in your article, is Lupo is initially able to get his death sentence lifted, but Dequila refuses to lift Morello's death sentence. So there's either through Lupo's contacts, Nino Grillo, or you know some, some other kind of sympathy, Dequila is willing to let Lupo live. He's not willing to let Morello, which plays into the political distinction between where you know Lupo's associated with a Palermo now. He comes from Paglia Relli. He has relationships to Dequila's allies in Palermo. Morello's from Corleone. He was the boss of a separate organization. So that's an intriguing part of all this, that Lupo was able to successfully petition for his life before Morello even able, was able to. And Nino Grillo, Antonino Grillo, seems to have been pivotal. In he may have been pivotal, too, in the, the election of Dequila as boss and the formation of the Mineo family. It's theoretical, but he, he continues to show up. I, I find him a very interesting figure because he continues to show up. He's a Palermo boss. All three men can be tied to him. You know, there's a lot of interesting connections, and uh, we try to make sense of them the best we can, you know, again, going by the available evidence. And, you know, later on, another informant by the name of Alfonso Atardi, and he was big in, uh, he was a big narcotics kingpin later on, and he worked with uh, Nicola Gentile in the 1930s. And he tells us that uh, Aquila's underboss was somebody named Salvatore Mambrao, and he later replaced Aquila, which is why we think the Salvatore Mambrao Brow may have been Manfredi Menea. Now, how to, uh, you know, put those two names together, we don't know. So we, we are positive that it's the same person. It's just a suspicion because you have to consider people's memories aren't so clear when they're recalling events going back 30, 40 years. You know, names get confused. So it's possible that he conflated Menea's name with someone else. Yeah, Mumbrao yeah. is spelled M-U-M-B-R-A-O. So there's some, you know, it's, it's not the same, but it's there's some phonetic similarity between Minio and Mumbrao. You know, it's it's, it's yeah, a, but it's you also awkward. have a complete, you also have completely different first names. Right. Yeah, but Sal or Al. I mean, it could have that could have been easily confused as well. Yeah, Manfred. Yeah, Joe Valachi called him Al Minio. Yeah. So is Al his nickname it, or? Banano too. Yeah, it's everyone Galachi. calls Al Mineo. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody could have been confusing Al for Sal, you know, 30 years later. Right. And another, uh, how did you get that from Manfredi? We don't know. But uh, did he use Salvatore as, uh, as an alias? And that's possible too. You know, again, another, we don't know a lot about this guy. Another possible uh, sign of, of some sort of connection between the Gambino and Colombo families is that Minio's, we don't know if he was his underboss or what he was, but his top lieutenant during the Castello Moraes War, who he was killed with in 1930, was uh, Stefano Ferrigno. And we, we assume Stef Stefano Ferrigno may have been a Gambino member time under Minio. His brother Bartolo Ferrigno later becomes a Colombo member. So if, if, right. if Stefano if Stefano Ferrigno was with the Gambino family and his brother Bartolo joins the Columbos, it shows there may have been some fluidity. Obviously, when you're a member of one group that's rigid, you're with that group, but transfers occur. These networks, you know, the Venn diagram of these networks overlap. In this case, Minio and Dequila seem to have had very much the same network, even though they were rivals. It seems like they were rivals within the same Palermitani network. But we do see some figures who are associated with both end up with both the Colombo and the Gambino families. Right. And, and later on, according to a different informant, Manfredi Mineo is giving orders to Johnny Bathbeach, Odo, and the Chief Bonacera. And those are both Provacci Colombo guys. Right. You know, so that shows a connection right there. And what we know, you know of the so early, sorry, what we know of the early Profaci family, pretty much up until the 1950s, heavily Palermitano. You know, you have the Profaci clan and, and their close allies who are from Villa Bate, which is, you know, right up there. It's a suburb of the city of Palermo. You see some guys from Carini. You also see some from Palermo proper. And so both of these families have a, a heavy concentration of men from Palermo, the city, as well as the immediate suburbs of it. So that, that shows, too, that they were made up of men from the same places. And some guys linked with Dequila were from Villabate and Carini as well. So again, there may have been some fluidity as politics changed. We're talking about multiple wars. We're talking about many people killed in these decades between Lupo being boss and uh, Dequila and Minio. Right. So I think some of the details we could probably fill the listeners in in a future episode mm -hmm. uh, because there's really a lot to discuss here. Absolutely. 
But it looks, getting back to the transition between Lupo to Daquila and Minio, who are bosses of their own separate families with heavy concentrations of Palermitani, you know, I think you can always argue that there's no true successor when an organization is split. It, as, as Angelo has put, you know, they're, they're sons from the same father. So you could see the Lupo organization as the father of both the Daquila and Minio families. There's more evidence of continuity with the Daquila family, not just the Palermitani, but also these guys from Agrigento that seem to have played a pivotal role. There was a rumored relation between the Agrigento guys and Lupo. Then they're under Daquila. So it does come across like the Daquila organization was more of a true successor to Lupo, if you want to make that argument. But then Minio seems to have branched off as well, or at least taken in part of that network. It and seems think- like that, but we really don't have any examples of guys going from Lupo to Mineo. That doesn't mean they're not there. It's just that we could not identify them. We right. can't really definitively state that Lupo's family was split up into two, or if they decided that you know, they're just going to be another one forming. Um, Again, 1910, you know, from 1910 to 1915, immigration was, you know, really at its peak. And the majority of people coming from Sicily would have came from Palermo because that's the port city. So that would make sense why Lupo and, you know, why the Palermitan faction network family would have been, you know, so large compared to the other groups, you know, the other two, the Corleonese and the um, Castadam race. So it would make sense why there would need to be two families. But also going back to um, the connections we see between Grillo and Daquila and the way the politics are closely linked between New York and Palermo, it could be speculated, not saying it's true, not even sure if I believe it, that the Daquila's removal disrupted the commerce going on between New York and Palermo, and they decided not to put all their eggs in one basket. I don't know. But another Mm -hmm. thing about the Quilla is in 1908, there was a um, crash, and it affected a lot of things in New York. And Lupo, he recipient of that. A lot of his stores um, went bad, his credit. He was um, being chased by his creditors. So when he got into counterfeiting again in 1910, he was in a very, he was strapped financially. And so was Morello because Morello, they were trying to build tenements up in the Bronx. And again, when the stock market crashed, business, legitimate business took a hit. And with Lupo, so, you know, just to, to kind of like wind this all together, to, you know, tie this all together, you know, Lupo has his death sentence lifted around 1922, maybe by 1923. He's at the very least not under threat of death from Daquila. There's a banquet held in his honor, I believe in 1923. And it's attended by, among other people, Carmelo Leconti, who is a Calabrian, but was very likely a Gambino member. His son of the same name later went on to be a Gambino member. He was made way later. So it seems like Lupo may have been accepted into that, into the Daquila family. We don't know for sure. But when Daquila's back, there's this banquet with figures that we can link to the Gambino family. Lupo continues on. He's obviously been humbled. He he never again becomes one of the main players in New York. But it does seem possible that he became a Daquila member. He's involved in some petty crimes, some some petty extortion, right, with his son. Yeah, he he can also transfer to uh, Messeria family, you know, because uh, Morello apparently became its underboss. Right. You know, we don't know specifically. Morello's official position, that's, we don't have any documentation for that. Uh, Joe Bonanno talks about him as a brain trust, you know, but uh, underboss is a good possibility. And and it's very likely because because he was brother-in-law with Lupo that he came in that family. So we can't rule that out either. Right. And it's evident, too, that, you know, as far as we know, Morello gets right back into the fold. He he's one of I mean, he may have been the guy in Masseria's ear motivating a lot of what took place in the late 20s and early 30s that brought on the Castello Murray's war. We'll visit that another time. But Morello, he's obviously he's a former Capo de Capi. He still wants to meddle in the affairs of New York and for that matter, the country. Lupo, though, his death sentence is lifted before Morello's. He's involved in some extortion and some things. He goes back to prison. It doesn't appear, though, that Lupo 
made any direct effort. He may have supported his brother-in-law, Morello, but there's no evidence that Lupo himself got directly involved in the, the high-level politics after his release from prison, is there? Yeah, Not if there were any backroom deals, we don't know about them. Yeah. Just and so, so, Lupo, so Lupo goes on to, he goes back to prison for a time. He eventually dies in 1947. You know, we don't really have very many high level sources from that era. This is before the 1960s when we have a lot of member informants and things like that cooperating with the FBI. So as far as we know, Lupo was a, a former boss who accepted his status as a soldier who knows who he reported to, who knows what family he was affiliated with, but he kind of, he just kind of dwindles into obscurity and eventually dies in 1947. But the reason I want, you know, I really pushed on this episode. I mean, you guys are very humble. You didn't demand to do an episode about your article. Your article had a profound effect on me and the way I view the New York organization. So I, I wanted to do this episode early on to lay, lay the groundwork for future discussions about the Gambino family by saying, no, the Gambino family didn't start under Dequila. It goes back to Ignacio Lupo in some form. How that family was split, if it was split at all between Dequila and Minio, it was it's a very important part of the story. It shows that the Gambino family goes back to the earliest available evidence on the five families as we know them shortly after the yeah. turn of the century. Yeah, I think I it's very like possible that the Gambino family is probably the oldest family. You know, it could go back as far as the 1870s, you know. Yeah, it's just about the same. We're, we're really short on, you know, direct connections. You know, it's, a, it's unfortunate. We're probably never going to be able to fill the gaps you know, the, of our historical knowledge, you know, we just have to accept that it's not there. Right. Uh, but, but I think it, there's evidence out there that it could be shown that and it's I think likely I, to be the oldest family. And you guys, uh, you, you know, people who want more in-depth, I mean, this show is conversation. You know, we're not here just, this isn't a documentary style show. We're not, you know, sitting here just reading from scripts. Uh, if somebody wants a more in-depth evidence-based understanding of what we're talking about, the May 2014 Informer Journal article you guys wrote is obviously where people should go from that. I wanted to do this episode, though, to have a conversation about Lupo's role in what we now know as the Gambino family. Uh, I think that we've laid that out pretty well here. I think that it, for those who are interested further, they can read your article, uh, ask questions. You know, I, I, right. I recommend people ask questions in the comments if they want. You know, we'll do our best to to address them or point you in the right direction. But is there any, are there any other core points about Lupo and the Gambino family that you guys want to make? Um, one thing I can quickly say is um, in Volacci's original manuscript, he did refer to the Mangano family as the old family or something to that mm -hmm. effect. I'm sure you guys recall that. Yeah, and it would make sense too that Palermo played a central role going back to at least the, the early 20th century. I mean, we know the role that the city of Palermo has played in the development of the mafia. You know, we don't know where the mafia originated in Sicily, but it's obvious that Palermo played a central role in Sicilian mafia history. I mean, it sounds almost silly to say that. Uh, it would make sense that it would play a pivotal role in New York, where we see the highest concentrations of Palermitani. Yeah. And two, a point I want to make before this is over is that if we look at the lineage of bosses of the Gambino family, it makes perfect sense that Lupo would have been the boss. We have Lupo, D'Aquila, Minio, Mangano, this five, six year period where Albert Anastasia, a Calabrian, is boss, then Carlo Gambino, then Paul Castellano. So for over 80 years of the known history of the Gambino family, all of the bosses, except for Albert Anastasia, were from the city of Palermo. And we see similar trend, we see similar patterns in the Bonanno family, where the vast majority of leaders were from Tropani, if not Castellamare del Golfo. So the fact that the Gambino family has such a long, I mean, 80 years, 84 years or something to that effect, 85 years, where only a little window of that in the 1950s is a non-Palermitano Anastasia that all of those bosses were from Palermo, Lupo fits in perfectly with that lineage. It, like I said, something clicked for me before I even saw the evidence you guys laid out in the article. Just you saying at the beginning, we've determined that Ignacio Lupo was the boss of this family. Something clicked because that fits this longer pattern, it fits a lot of the relationships that we see spanning decades. Uh, you know, Palermo obviously was important in early New York. It makes sense that the Gambino family traces itself back much earlier than Dequila even. Yeah, it's totally by coincidence 
is that in the last, you know, 10 years, you had Salvatore Montaigne, Casta de Mores of the Bananos. Um, you had the guy that said to be in charge of the Genovese today, who's got Corleonese roots. And then the Palermitan has, you know, allegedly taken back control of the Gambinos. Despite a hundred years of changes, you know, twists and turns, those roots, those foundations are still very much in those groups. Even a group like the Genovese, who underwent the most radical change of family appears to still have that genetic code in them. Absolutely. We see evidence of these early patterns over a hundred years later. That's one of the things that draws us in is as much as things change, we do see this sort of rhyming. I would refer to it as kind of like a rhyming sequence. Like you said, the fact that the current alleged Genovese boss, Corleone, Sal Montaigne, as well as people like the Aceros, some of these other figures who are influential in the Bananos, still trace the roots to Castellamare, as you said. And then you have people like Frank Cali, Domenico, Cerfalu, these people who have been linked to the Gambino leadership today, the Sicilian faction, come from these same parts of Palermo that we see under Lupo and Daquila. And it's it's just incredible. You know, it truly is. It's It's what makes me continue to be so interested in this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot more to it than blood and bullets. Otherwise, I would have absolutely. lost interest a long time ago. All of absolutely. us would Well, guys, I mean, I think this was a great... We'll, we'll be revisiting some of these people, particularly the Dequila era. You know, you guys have a lot of insight into that. We wanted to avoid going in-depth about Dequila's time as boss because we have a lot more information on that period. We have some other stuff on Minio we'll be going into. But I wanted to do this... One to spotlight your work because you guys, you guys are the ones who discovered this. You guys are the ones who made this connection and didn't just throw With it out. Leonard, in don't What's forget that? Leonard. Leonard, yeah. When I say you guys, I mean Leonard's right in there. All right. Can, ne- can never forget for the audience's benefit. What's that? Leonard, just for the audience's benefit, we couldn't have done it without Leonard. We appreciate that, and as well as we see it as kind of the continuation of, in many ways the origin of, of organized crime in America by David Critchley. Right. You know, that was a pivotal book. And, you know, I'm glad to have uh, contributed to it, you know, in doing the research and, and some of the ideas that were sprouted in doing the research for that book developed and were furthered in this article. And there was a lot more material available to us later on that, you know, we didn't have uh, back yeah, but, in the, around 2002, 2001. Yeah, it's the it's the the way research on this subject develops is you know it doesn't exist in a vacuum. You know, I had read Dave's book, um, Original Organ- Organized Crime in America, obviously before your article, and you built on that. You provided clarification on certain details based on the evidence you found. You added to what he already did, had some different interpretations, but you know you obviously contributed to that book. You did research for it. And, you've collaborated, but your article built on that. And as you guys said in your article, you know, you want people to build on your research as well. You know, more details have come out. And I want to add too, that in my own research, I've only found more circumstantial evidence that supports your conclusions. And I, and you know, I'd be happy to challenge you. I'd be happy to ask questions. The Lupo thing is one element of your article that I, I have no questions about. I, I obviously have other questions in connection to it, but in terms of challenging it or finding any fault in it, I really have none. Angelo specifically asked me eight years ago to uh, go through it with a fine tooth comb and push back on anything I saw that didn't quite sit right. And with the, the basic premise of it, I really haven't been able to do that. I've only found more circumstantial evidence as we've had conversations you know, this might sound congratulatory, but this is something that, you know, I really wanted to put out there early on when we did this, because that's a big discovery. When you find out that somebody was the boss of a family and that it connects to one of the most well-known mafia families in history, that's a big deal. That's a big discovery. Uh, And I highly recommend people read the article. It's easy to read. It's well written. Uh, we'll provide a link to it, and that's what you guys contributed to early New York mafia history. So I appreciate you guys willing to talk about it. I think that this will be a jumping-off point for all future discussions about the Gambino fan. Sounds good. Yep. I think that's a wrap. That's a wrap.